I'm delighted to have uh, uh, David Tillman uh, come and talk to us today. He's, of course, uh, as I think you probably all know, one of the most foremost ecologists in, in the nation. He earned his PhD from the University of Michigan in 1976, and he came straight here to be an assistant professor. And he's been here ever since, and now he's a regents professor and a McMahon president in ecology. He also directs the Cedar Creek uh, Ecosystem Science uh, Long-Term Ecological Research Station, which um, is the subject of uh, Gina's dissertation. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, um, uh, David has many honors, including a Humboldt Medal, Guggenheim Fellowship. He's a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences. According to Google Scholar, uh, uh, his work has been cited 93,000 times. Uh, Web of Science uh, says that he's the world's most cited ecologist. Uh, so he's best known for his work on the causes and consequences and conservation of diverse biodiversity and how managed and natural ecosystems can sustainably meet human needs for food, energy, and ecosystem services. But today, he's going to talk about a topic of huge importance for demography, which is the environmental impact of feeding 9 to 11 billion people. And I would like to present you with your pay. Oh, Much tremendous. coveted. NPC seminar series. Mm -hmm. uh, that Absolutely. By giving a talk Excellent. Thank you. Well, it was a pleasure to be here. It's always fun to come back to the the busier part of campus. I lived uh, in what a building that used to be next to Kaufman Union. Lived there as an academic, not as a home, for I don't know twenty some years until I was moved over to uh, the pastures of St. Paul. Um, so <clears throat> I'm an ecologist who became very interested in. Um, agriculture because of its environmental impacts and also uh, because of the clear um, trade-offs that we face. I I'm, I'm firmly believe that, that, the, uh, the, that food should be a human right, that the ac access to adequate diet should be something we provide uh, in one way or another to everyone on earth. But I also believe we have to do this in a way that uh, keeps the earth a livable place in the long term. And is that trade-off between meeting one kind of human need for food, or it could be for timber, for housing, and so on, and meeting other long-term needs for society, a sustainable environment. Uh, that The trade-offs and conflicts there are an interesting place to look. Initially, it seemed quite discouraging, but actually there are lots of solutions that we can come up with. And the real question at the end of today's talk is, are, do we yet have any solutions that people actually adopt? Because showing mathematically something as a solution doesn't mean it'll actually happen, as we all know. So I want to talk about this. So um, global agriculture clearly is essential for humanity. It's really what our whole civilization is based upon, the advances in agriculture that started about 10,000 years ago. But it's also uh, very likely the largest single cause of harm to the environment. A quarter of all greenhouse gases are produced by our food production system. That does not include cooking and, and transport and so on after, after uh, production on a farm. Just the farm side, clearing land and farming is a quarter of all greenhouse gases. Uh, it's a major source, as we know, of pollutants and other ecosystems that come off of these agricultural lands. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and pesticides uh, move into the air as well as into waters and so on and have impacts in those systems. And uh, about half of all the land that you might consider usable, get rid of Antarctica, Greenland, and tundra, uh, is already dedicated to agricultural production. About 80% of that is in pasture, which, is a, which can be, but is not always, a pretty gentle way to use the land, and the rest is in annual croplands. So the first thing I want to look at is where are we going on food demand? Clearly, we expect to need more, a, a greater global food supply in the future because we're going to have about 30% more people come out the year 2050 by the, the middle mid-range projections of the UN. Um, but also what affects future food demand is dietary choices. So you can all think about what you just chose today. <laughs> You're now my willing subjects. Um, so here's what uh, the UN says is going to happen to population. And uh, throughout uh, the beginning of this talk, um, because so many things seem to depend upon uh, 
societal features that are associated with their economic status. I've divided the 100 largest uh, countries in the world by population into the countries with the uh, highest per capita GDPs, group A, the 15 countries there, the next one are the next 15 richest countries, B, all the way down to G, which are the, the, the remaining ones, is about 25 of the lowest per capita GDPs of the, 20, of the 100 largest nations on Earth. And the black bars show where we are right now for population, and the white bars above them show the projected growth by the UN for those nations. And so what you can see is the rich ones aren't growing very quickly, and the poorer and poorer they are, the, ra the more rapid their growth rates are. Nothing surprising. And you can see the bar E, which includes India, is going to have 1.2 or so billion more people coming into that particular economic slice. Well, that's what's happening to population. Um, we've done many, many analyses on what seems to be associated with different dietary choices, and the overriding strongest variable of everyone we've ever tried, and we've looked at various cultural, religious, uh, national, and so on differences, turns out to be income. To some extent, what I'm showing you are what you might call revealed preferences. As incomes go up in the world, and what these are, each data point is a point for, on average, all of Group A nations for a year. And the points start in 1961, which like here is 1961. And as incomes go up, they march up like this. There is 2003 was, a, I guess, the last point for this slide. Uh, so each of those is a trajectory. Uh, and you can see what happened to the richest nations, where they were in 61, where they are now, and so on. So these are a trajectory, a revealed preference for how changing in per capita GDP seems to relate to here demand for calories. Now, I saw all of you taking food. I don't think any of you are going to be eating 9,000 calories today, are you? <laughs> but this is the per capita demand for crop production of calories in the richest nations. And we can look at a per capita demand for crop production of plant protein the same way. Here are the same nations. See, I didn't have all the color coding here, but the same thing. The, the poorest nations up to the richest nations going from 1961 to 2003. Again, you can see a, a pretty... I thought a pretty amazingly tight relationship between per capita GDP and uh, changes in, in demand for crop protein. The crop protein is being produced. Now, we have to eat about 50 grams of protein per day to, have, to be healthy. And uh, not many of us are probably really eating 350 grams of protein per day, but that's what's being produced on our behalf per day uh, per person around the world in the richest countries. And the difference between these, as we all know, comes from meat demand. Because the difference between the 2,000 or so calories that we actually eat per day and the 9,000 that, that are produced per day in the richest countries, and this is once you get rid of exports and imports that actually stay in that country divided by how many people there are, that difference is our crops that are fed to livestock. And this shows what happens to the global demand for meat. This is meat protein um, consumed per day. So this is grams of protein in the meat now, not just, just the meat. And uh, I split India and China out because they have a little bit different um, dynamics than the other nations I, I was showing you before. But again, there's a pretty interesting trend from the poorest nations eating, oh, two to five grams of animal protein uh, per day, of meat per day, and the richest eating 35 or so grams of, of uh, protein per day, of actually eating it, consuming it. And it is this big increase in the amount of meat consumed, which is why 9,000 calories of uh, crop production and 300, 300, 350 uh, grams of protein production by plants is needed to provide this food, is the inefficiency of conversion once you take these feeds and give them to livestock. Well, we can use these data and ask what kind of demand, what the demand for food might be in the year 2050. To do that, we have to know what's going to happen to incomes by 2050. And there are lots of forecasts of incomes for different nations. And you can do your own. You can look, there's a Kuznet function between the rate of change uh, in um, in per capita income and what incomes are. The highest growth rates are in moderately poor developing nations, you know, four or five or so percent per year, and the declines beyond that as you go to richer and richer nations down to one and a half or two percent of real growth per year. But from those kind of models, uh, the data are out there, and you can show what's going to happen to the projected per capita GDP, the per capita buying power, if you will, in various nations. Goes up a bit in the richest nations, goes up more and more and more as you get to poor nations until you get to the really poor ones where they're really stagnant economies. They don't go, it doesn't go up at all. So with that increase in income, you can imagine 
how the curve they showed you for demand would shift up along the fitted curve. That's just what I did for, for this graph, simply following up the, the mean fitted relationship and projected for each of the economic groups what the uh, caloric demand would be per person per day. And what you can see is that uh, the sort of moderate income nations, this is sort of a China-like nation. These are a bit poorer than China, Indonesia, Malaysia here. Um, by the year 2050 are projected to have income such that they have per capita demand for calories that are pretty much like what is being done right now in the 15 richest nations. So they're moving, if you will, up the economic ladder and, and changing their demand. And it's not quite as dramatic here in these, in these other countries. You can do this for pr protein demand as well as uh, for KCAL. And when you do, and you multiply these numbers together and add them all up, basically you come up with that we're going to need, compared to how much crop protein is produced right now, 110% more than we produce right now in the year 2050, and about 100% more. I didn't do that. Um, I once gave a talk where somebody put this little timing thing into my slides. It was supposed to be one of these rapid talks, mm -hmm. and I must not have removed it from this slide. Well, if this keeps happening, I apologize. <laughs> but I should talk more rapidly anyway. <laughs> OK, and so basically, compared to the 30% increase in income, you sort of multiply these two numbers together, uh, population changing uh, and uh, income changing. The 30% uh, increase in population plus income is what combines to give us this doubling in global food demand. So I want to talk with you about then saying if this is uh, indicative of where, what food demand might be, what does it imply for the environment? What are its impacts going to be? Well, clearly, the impact of higher food demand is going to depend upon um, how much food we can get per acre of land, what the yield is going to be, uh, calories per hectare, protein per hectare, whatever yield unit we might want to use, and how these yields are obtained, how we grow the crops. So I want to look at those two aspects of this. First, I want to show you so what yields have been traditionally. Here are these same economic groups, the richest to the poorest, and here are the yields from 1960 until the present time. There, look at that. Uh, so yields are totally flat in the poorest countries. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Am I back there? No. Um, totally flat in the poorest countries uh, and higher and higher and steeper uh, in the richest countries. And there's been a lot of agronomic work. There are some countries that are poor and don't have the soils or the climate to grow crops. But the agronomic work done in the vast majority of these countries with very low yields Sorry, I went through too quickly on my own to know this happened. Um, uh, um, many of these countries with low yields actually have the potential to have yields as high as the richest countries have. They have soils and climate that do that. And some of them even could be higher because they have uh, dual crops in them. So this, these are the yields that exist. If you just were to take these data and say, if these yield trends continue uh, from now till 2050, and if those are the yields that nations would have, you could ask, well, what would be the impacts of that? And this is something we did in a paper we had that came out in, in science, I think, in 2001, quite a while ago now. Very simple extrapolation. And what it says is you're going to need, I'm sorry, you're going to need about 800 million more hectares of land. Now, the United States is 900 million hectares in area. That's including Alaska and Hawaii. So the, our nation is at 900 million. We're going to have to clear about 800 million more hectares of land which is about a 60% increase in global cropland, if yields keep going up like that, to, to be able to provide the demand for food that we envision the world uh, will have. And this is that in the last 40 years, uh, we've actually cleared 600 million hectares. So this is about the same rate we've been doing. It's just a little bit ramping up a little bit uh, compared to what it had been. So there are about um, two... Uh, 2,000 million or 2 billion hectares of land uh, that are left there that are all suitable for agriculture. And most of them are uh, tropical rainforests, tropical grasslands, tropical savannas, as well as a few little bit remnants of grasslands and, and forests other parts of the world. But, but the majority are tropical habitats around the world. So I want to talk about the potential, first, the impacts of land clearing. What does it do? Why does it matter? Um, you know, if there were no other way to feed people, I would say we should clear all the land it takes to provide people adequate diets. Uh, that's just sort of my personal moral stance on the issue. Uh, but luckily, there are lots of solutions to these kinds of problems. We do not need to go down the path here of 800 million hectares. So 
one of the issues with, with um, clearing down these remaining natural ecosystems is they contain lots of species. And we already have, of all the, the 23,000 terrestrial vertebrates, basically mammals, uh, birds, um, reptiles, and amphibians that are recorded to occur in all the, all the nations of the earth that are included in the IUCN Red Book, which is most of the nations. Um, the IUCN says that basically 24% of these existing species are already threatened with extinction. Low populations, declining populations, threatened with extinction um, because of human activities. And that the biggest one of all these threats is agricultural land clearing. 80% of the threatened species are, th are threatened by agriculture. So if we have to clear a lot more land, we'll not only have a higher proportion of the total uh, animal diversity of land, of the vertebrate diversity of land be threatened by agriculture, but many things which are already threatened will be much, much more threatened. And for instance, if you look at Nation by Nation, which is a project we're working on right now, and how much land might need to be cleared to feed people in Nigeria or uh, various other countries that are growing pretty rapidly right now, Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on, um, often the projected food demand and yield curves as they exist right now would say that they will basically clear all land remaining in those nations that is all suitable for agriculture, and they still won't be able to feed themselves. So it's not a pleasant trajectory to imagine that we stay on the yield trends I showed you um, and people meet their needs with local food production, which is what, what traditionally is done in poorer countries. There is already a major threats and the threats are very likely to escalate very rapidly. I just came back in the beginning of September from uh, going out to Borneo and really enjoyed seeing they have these wonderful diptyocarp forests they're called, but you don't find very many. They mainly find piles of logs, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, with these have numbers on the end to identify the source when they go to the sawmill. And once the logs are all cleared off, the bulldozers get rid of everything else and, sh and um, palm oil, oil palm is planted. And oil palm is actually a wonderful crop in many ways. It has the highest caloric yield per hectare of anything grown on earth. It's about double sugarcane, and sugarcane is double any grain. So there are some advantages to it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, uh, but um, with increasing demand for food, uh, when I flew across Sabah, this province in uh, Malaysia, uh, half of my flight, when I looked down, I saw rows and rows of, of oil palm. It's really taking over the countryside and the rainforest is being lost. These are real problems. They happen in, in North America. When we came in, they're happening there. There are a lot of ethical, moral issues associated with what should be done. Uh, but um, well, I'll talk about some solutions which I think meet uh, and fulfill all of the ethical concerns you might have uh, and actually can help prevent that from being much more extensive than it already has been. So where are we now? Well, as I mentioned to you, about half of all global ecosystem, all the land that's usable on Earth has already been turned into agriculture. And when this happens, they are very different kinds of ecosystems than they were before. They're much less stable than they were before. They're often frequently disturbed by grazing or plowing or clear cutting, whatever it might be. Um, they tend to leak a lot of nutrients from them. Even without fertilizing, they leak nutrients. And when you fertilize, they leak more. They also tend to have been carbon sinks that would be a taking carbon dioxide from the air and storing it in biomass and soils. And instead of that become major carbon sources. Land clearing is a major source of greenhouse gas emission to the atmosphere around the world right now. And it is likely to stay that way if we clear the amount of land I've been uh, suggesting we might be on a trajectory to do. And what happens is in this is that these systems which had 100, 200 or more plant species per hectare as well as lots of uh, insect species, uh, mammals, vertebrates of various kinds, end up being reduced down to one or if it's a pasture, maybe 10 species per hectare. So a massive loss of diversity. So Steve already mentioned that I've done a lot of work on diversity. I couldn't talk to you without sharing the last 20 years of my life. So um, and you're going to get a little biodiversity lecture right now. So the question is, does the loss of diversity matter? And uh, I became very excited by that question uh, in the uh, early 1990s. In 1994, we set up an experiment, which none like this had ever been done in ecology, where we manipulated diversity in each of these plots, which are 30 by 30 feet in size. Um, and each plot we plant in either one, two, four, eight, or 16 species. And each, the composition of each plot was chosen by random draw from a pool of native prairie perennial plants. So these are long live perennial plants native to tall grass prairie. We had 18 plants we chose from among to plant each of these plots. And so by randomly locating these in the field, by randomly choosing composition, 
uh, we are able to average across the effect of which species were in a plot and ask what is the effect of how many species there are in, the, in a plot. And um, when we set this up, we had no idea whether this would matter or not. In fact, some of the, um, well, I didn't get any funding for this, but I was lucky that the um, Andrew Mellon Foundation had handed me a big pot of money that I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted with, so we spent it to set up this experiment. So here's what we found. What we found is that as you increase uh, the number of plant species in the plot, the productivity, this is the amount of biomass produced per year. If you were to mow this, let's say, for hay and weigh the hay, this would be how much hay is produced per, uh, per unit of, of area per year. Each dot there is, actual, is an actual plot. So these are all the data, nothing hidden here. Every single data point is shown here. And compared to the average of all of these species growing by themselves in monoculture, uh, the 16 species, high diversity plots, are more than 200% more productive. They basically have three times the biomass of the other ones. It's a huge effect. No one ever imagined, including me, I'd done some mathematics of how, what diversity should do, and the effect size in my models was about 70% increase with going to high diversity. And that's what we saw initially, but that initial increase actually became larger and larger and larger through time. So there's a big effect of diversity. If you just choose a single best species, that's the, each, each of these is the mean of a monoculture, of, of a species of monoculture, the single best species growing there, uh, every single high diversity plot is more productive than that single best species growing in, in monoculture. And, uh, and those are what 60% 60 60 more productive than the single best species. So if you just try to do what a farmer does, find the best, most productive crop for your piece of land uh, and grow it, you don't get anywhere the return you could have by growing a mixture of species. Now, I only can quickly tell you why diversity matters. There's nothing at all magical about this. In nature, we have uh, on the order of five or so million different species coexisting mm -hmm. on Earth. And all the work that has been done on interacting and coexisting species says species only coexist when they have trade-offs, when the species gets to be better at doing one thing by becoming worse at something else. If there are those trade-offs, those trade-offs allow things to coexist. It also tells you why having more species present in a system affects how that system functions. Each of these species is a, like, like a specialist profession in a human society. They do something very well, and everything else they don't do at all well. So when they're together, each one ends up only being able to do what it does well. It's outcompeted for all the things it doesn't do well. It, it sort of does its profession in that ecosystem. It does what it does well. And the net effect of having organisms which are highly specialized and do one thing very well is that, that how well each one does adds up to make the whole system do much better, to be much more productive. And I'll show you what else happens there. They're more productive. Um, in these more <coughs> diverse systems that are more productive, um, the reason that we go from that 70%, I, I told you this predicted by theory, to the 200 some percent increase that we actually see has to do with some feedback effects. So, when these plants are growing, every year they shed leaves, they shed roots, they, they grow again. The ones that are more productive because of high diversity shed more carbon, more organic matter every year. That goes back in and actually makes the soil more fertile through time. And this is the amount of carbon that has been stored as organic matter in the soil of these plots in monoculture 2, 4, 8, or 16 <coughs> species. And what you see is this soil has a lot more carbon being gained in the plots that have high diversity mixtures. And this is how much nitrogen is in those soils and how it's changing through time. And again, going from 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16 species, more diverse plots actually accumulate more and more organic nitrogen. And that organic nitrogen is broken down by bacteria to make nitrate and ammonia that plants grow on. And so there's this feedback effect. The plots that had the advantage of being more diverse and being more productive pump, in, pump back more organic matter into the system, which actually makes them more and more productive through time. And so these plots have just been having their productivity increase through time. And they're only 20 years old. Native prairie is thousands of years old. And so um, this is sort of indicative of, of likely where native prairie was or is going. And also sort of tells you what happens when you have the system go backwards. If you have a diverse system and you simplify it, you go from systems that can store large amounts of carbon to ones that really can't. So I'll just show you uh, on the carbon side, since carbon storage is a very valued ecosystem service that uh, diverse systems provide, if you look at the rates of carbon storage in these plots, they, 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 are, they reveal themselves as differential equations which you can integrate and solve. And this is the solution to those equations. It is empirical uh, in, in, uh, differential equations. And so 
carbon starts out at some level, it accumulates and eventually reaches an asymptote after about 200 years by the race that we see. And in a more diverse system, it, it increases more quickly and asymptotes at a higher level. And we get about 35 more tons of the element C removed from the atmosphere stored as organic carbon in high diversity plots than in the typical monoculture. So it's a huge ecosystem service provided by high diversity plots that we no longer have on five out of our 10 billion uh, acres of terrestrial land. We also see that the plots that are more diverse are more stable. The amount of biomass they produce year after year after year varies less in response to climate than happens in plots that are less diverse. So more diverse plots not only are more productive, but what they produce is actually more stable, less variable from one year to the next. Uh, more diverse plots, um, part of the reason why they're more productive is they're better able to obtain the limiting resources. They drive the concentration of nitrate and phosphate, the limiting resources in these, in these soils down to a lower concentration, down to a lower level than happens in low diversity plots. Now that itself explains, partly explains why Higher diversity leads to greater productivity. These higher diversity plots actually have more root mass. The roots of the different species, when they compete with each other, actually separate spatially and they end up filling a bigger volume of soil with roots at a higher density, a higher total root mass than you have in, by anything growing in monoculture. And that drives down nitrate. But what else happens, if you measure the water leaving these systems that goes into the groundwater, lakes, rivers, and streams, from these high diverse systems, the water actually has lower concentrations of remaining nutrients, so the water quality, the drinking water quality, lakes, rivers, and so on, are cleaner from these high diversity systems than from low. And that's without uh, fertilizing the low corn monocultures with lots of nitrogen. And finally, you can ask um, how important is diversity compared to other things? When we started these experiments, Everyone would have said, well, what did, if you ask some, an ecologist what determines productivity, well, they would have said, well, it really depends upon how fertile the soil is. Well, here are ways to change soil fertility by adding different amounts of nitrogen on the low nitrogen sandy soils at our research site. Uh, they'd all say, well, water really matters. Well, here's what happens if you add water. Here's what happens in the natural droughts. Um, people might not have said CO2, but we have an experiment where we add CO2. That's the effect size. People might say, well, herbivores are really important. Well, we have experiments where we have herbivores present or absent, and we have things that are burned or not burned. Of all these forces that ecologists would have said 20 years ago are important, the one they wouldn't have said was diversity. But it turns out diversity is as large or larger in terms of its effects on productivity, and we've also looked at the same thing for stability, uh, than any of these other variables. Diversity really is one of the central driving forces determining how ecosystems operate, which means that <coughs> human uh, ecosystem change, which causes a loss of diversity, which simplifies them, has some significant implications for the services these ecosystems uh, can provide to society. So I also mentioned nutrient pollution as an issue. I give you a lot less information on, on this one because I think you know this pretty well. Um, right now, if you look at the total amount of nitrogen and phosphorus applied uh, to terrestrial ecosystems and agriculture around the world as nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer. Each of those is more nitrogen than all known natural processes creates on land in the world uh, and for nitrogen. And for phosphorus, it's more than all known ways that in, uh, unavailable phosphorus in soils, rocks, etc., is made available by microbial or plant action. So we've actually more than doubled the global supply of what used to be the two major limiting resources in ecosystems. Now one thing that happens, and I pull out the slides to save some time, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, that wasn't wise of me. Um, when you add more of a limiting resource to an ecosystem, because nitrogen has been limiting on Earth probably from the first emergence of life, nitrogen you know, is a very stable gas, N2 in the atmosphere. It takes immense energy to break that N2 bond. When N2 bond forms, you get explosive energy out. Bombs are made out of nitrate, ammonia. You know, the, the Oklahoma City problem, the building was bags of fertilizer next to bags of diesel fuel. Incredible energy is taken to release the bond. So in the history of evolution of life on Earth, nitrogen has been a very rare resource. So an incredible number of species are adapted to efficiently obtain and use nitrogen. When nitrogen rates go up, those traits no longer matter. That was their specialty. Their specialty doesn't matter. And all that's left they can do are the things they're bad at. And so they get squeezed out. When you actually have nitrogen deposition uh, onto land, for, from nitrogen from agriculture that comes back down to land and rain and so on, 
you lose plant diversity. When you add a lot of nitrogen to uh, oceans, you lose algal diversity and so on. So you lose diversity because of nitrogen pollution. Uh, and clearly in doing that, you have a few species that take over and eutrophy, cause water pollution that has big impacts on water quality, uh, drinking water quality, fishing, and many other things. Um, and the sort of business as usual approach to increasing yields that we're on, just those straight lines and what might happen with yields going up that way, those ways mean we'll be using 140% more N and 110% more phosphorus fertilizer by the year 2050. More than doubling what we've already doubled. We've already doubled it, we'll double it again. Uh, I don't think we'd see many clean looking bodies of water uh, left around the world if we actually go along that path. Here's where we were before. Here's what actually did happen in the Green Revolution. We doubled global food in the Green Revolution by increasing, which one is nitrogen? Nitrogen blue dots went from 10 to 70. Seven fold more nitrogen was required to double global food in the Green Revolution. Uh, three times more phosphorus and uh, well, I don't know what the, the water increases on a bad axis, maybe 50%, 40% more water, something like that. So major inputs are required to do that. And that's the trajectory we're on right now uh, for the future, for uh, the environmental impacts on, on nutrient side. Now there's one other thing, and that is that uh, nitrogen fertilizer, about 1% of the N in nitrogen fertilizer is turned by microbes into nitrous oxide, laughing gas. But it, you shouldn't laugh at it because it's an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. About 200 times more potent uh, than CO2. Um, it's about a fourth of all current uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture comes from nitrous oxide. And our, our guess is this is going to more than double along our current trajectory of agriculture. And I mentioned what happens when these nutrients hit the ocean. Here's some pictures <coughs> provided by Bob Haworth of an area in the Gulf of Mexico away from where the Mississippi flows in and, and does its thing with nitrogen. And then an area where, where that does happen. And you can see clean, this is looking through water, clear water, you can see through uh, macrophytic plants living on the bottom, and then you can see just very dense algae and, and epiphytes covering the macrophytes. These are the dead zone-like areas. So, I know this is a downer so far, I'm only giving you the bad things, right? <laughs> I apologize, but I had to let you know how bad it was so you could be so happy when you see their solutions. Um, so finally, just one slide on greenhouse gases. I said that greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture are already 25% of global emissions. And they, that comes from emissions from ruminants, which are about a third of that. So methane reduced by cattle, sheep, goats is a huge source of greenhouse gases because methane is a potent greenhouse gas. It comes from nitrous oxide and land clearing. The next on the list is fossil use on farms, which is not big in, in terms of, is not at all as big as, as the rest of these in terms of what it does. So. Uh, the agricultural emissions that we think uh, are going to be, will be quite a bit larger. Um, I thought I had, I guess when I rewrote this slide, I didn't tell you the, the outcome. All the estimates are that greenhouse gas emissions are going to approximately double from where they are right now from agriculture if we continue along our current uh, trajectories. So now I rush to talk to this part, to get to this part. So that was a... Uh, a massive condensation of, of uh, lots of different things we've been playing with for quite a while on food. So what are the solutions? I'm going to talk about three of them in some depth. One is diet. The next is closing this yield gap, helping those low yielding countries have higher yields, helping them attain yields closer to what their, what their potential might be. And the last is more efficient use of fertilizer. Now let's look at diet. Um, we had a paper on this last year, it came out in November. Um, to some extent, it was proving the obvious, but in a way that Nature actually published it, so that was good. <laughs> um, so the world is undergoing this massive nutrition transition, it's called. And it's a, 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 as diets for people, as people become richer, they change their diets. And as they go to cities, they change their diets. And they change their diets in ways which we've already showed. They have, um, they eat more meat, uh, they eat more uh, calories, um, they eat more uh, protein. Uh, did they have empty calories on here? Total refined fat. Yeah. These are empty calories. Uh, these are the calories that they only give you calories. There's nothing else they give you. Um, normally, they're, they're, it's sugar, fats, oils, and alcohol. Um, so if you look at this, 1,400 calories per day 
in the 15 richest countries is what people tend to get from empty calories. That's pretty amazing. Fat. Fat, sugar, alcohol. Three of the building blocks of most people's diets. <laughs> so what is happening in this global nutrition transition is that uh, because of these kinds of diets, people are not getting the micronutrients they need, which come from vegetables and fruits. We're supposed to have about 10 servings of vegetables and fruits. Most people in the US have about three. Um, so we're not getting what we need that way. We're getting calories that don't have anything else with it. This leads to uh, being overweight, to uh, obesity, uh, leads to diabetes. There's a globally emerging epidemic of diabetes and other non-communicable diseases like heart disease and some forms of cancer that is occurring. China, as it went, underwent industrialization in 1980, had less than 1% diabetes in its population. Uh, by the year 2000, it had more than 10% and is still growing. India has massive problems with diabetes. They're vegetarian, but they must be eating a lot of these empty calories, in my honest guess. It's also true that people of, of Asian descent tend to be more susceptible to diabetes for a given diet. They tend to get diabetes at a lower, at a smaller increase in body mass index, BMI, uh, and at a younger age uh, than do uh, people of European descent. So diabetes, as well as heart disease and cancer, are major problems that are happening, changing around the world in response to diet. Now, there have been lots of studies, lots of long-term cohorts of people have been followed. Walter Willard has done this with the, I think it's the nurses study, if I remember. Uh, we, in this paper, we summarize results. We have not done any of this work. We just took the numbers that are out there, added them, and, and divided them, and calculated standard deviations. So there's nothing original on our part. I just want to show you what the trends are. This shows alternative diets. The Mediterranean diet was one of the first ones that was thought to be healthier. And this is a reduction in risk of type 2 diabetes for people who adhere to the upper fourth of the variation in, in being a Mediterranean diet-like person. 17, 16% less diabetes. Here are people who are pescatarian, which is a vegetarian diet plus fish. And that's about a 25% reduction in diabetes. Here are people who are vegetarian, a 44 or so percent reduction in diabetes. And this is controlling for all the things good epi epidemiologists would control for. Um, here are cancers. There are significant effects. Um, the uh, effect size is not all as big as for the other ones. Not all cancers are, seem to be affected by diet, but there, is, there are lower rates of, of cancer. Um, mortality, this is not just disease, this is mortality from heart disease. And here we're, we're right around what 20 or so percent reduction in mortality from heart disease by having a Mediterranean pescatarian or vegetarian diet. Now, med Mediterranean diet is not one where you get a chow down on pasta uh, and so on. A Mediterranean diet is defined as the traditional diet of the people who lived on the coast of the Mediterranean. And these people had, uh, on average, about 10 servings a day of fruits and vegetables. They had about one serving a, a week of, of any kind of meat other than fish and a couple servings of fish a week. Their main uh, other calorie sources were nuts. Olive oil was their only oil. So that's the Mediterranean diet. I talked about this in Spain and Italy last year. And all the people were smiling in the audience. They ate a Mediterranean diet. And I showed them what a Mediterranean diet had. And they all were crestfallen because <laughs> almost nobody eats it anymore. <laughs> so you can see the effects here. And then here is overall mortality rate. And that's really the fun one. Look at those poor vegetarians. <laughs> they never die. You know why that is? This is, no, this is, they, um, this is a change in the mortality rate. There's no change. It turns out at least for the uh, couple hundred thousand vegetarians who were in the surveys that have been done, people who choose to be vegetarian, which is really what this is, already chose not to smoke. They chose to exercise. They chose to have a good body weight. And those things make them live so long, they just die of natural causes at that same age. And having being a vegetarian doesn't give them added life. But they are the longest live people of everybody on this graph. They just don't get any added life that is detectable once you control for everything else, as good ep epidemiologists would do. So, so that's sort of the health side. So the question is, what would happen if the world were to shift somewhat toward these diets? Now, I don't know how we can get this to happen. Um, you're the social scientist, after all. And you can make this happen, but ecologists don't know how to change people's behavior. But you guys do. So here's what would happen. <laughs> uh, here's greenhouse gas emissions. This is only the emissions from producing the food, not the land clearing and everything else. So, um, but the greenhouse gas emissions, here's what they are right now. And there's how much more they'd go up. Uh, 
these are gigatons. Let me see, total emissions of fossil fuels are nine gigatons. So this is 1.5 or 20 or so percent of current global emissions would be a 20% increase in current levels would occur if people kept eating the normal old diets. This is business as usual diet. It sort of fell off the screen here, sorry. Here's what happened to the Mediterranean, pescatarian, and vegetarian diet. Um, much lower emissions, a, a small increase compared to now, and actually less emissions, less global emissions in total from agricultural food production in the year 2050 than now if people had those diets. Those diets also greatly influence how much land is needed. So this is a, a more complex model than I ever used before and was suggested by the multiple rounds of review this paper went through, really good suggestions. I never want my papers to fly through in the first round because reviewers have good ideas. And so this is a much more complex model of land use which includes uh, trade among nations and taking advantage of com uh, taking, using comparative advantages and yields to try to reduce total uh, man, uh, demand and so on. Um, here is by that model, which includes a lot of trade and so on, uh, how much land would be cleared by 2050 uh, with current diets and how much less would be needed with these other diets. So a big effect of changing toward diets that are healthier uh, in terms of the benefit, uh, the environmental benefits. As you know, there's a bit of a controversy going on right now with the USDA and their committee uh, that, is that is supposed to give dietary guidelines to the US. Uh, a bit of a controversy is an understatement if you've been paying attention to it. Their guidelines uh, suggested that the diets that were healthier for people also had environmental benefits. They actually didn't say you should eat them because of the benefits. They thought it might actually encourage people to adopt the diet if it was both healthy and better for the environment. But um, the diets included less red meat. And the resulting politics means that it will probably never be the official recommendation of the USDA. Okay. There's another solution that is higher yields. I showed you those yield graphs through time and how low the yields were for the poor nations and how high they were for the rich ones. Well, it's very possible to get a lot more food off much of the land that's already cleared around the world, that's already being used for food production. The yields in many developing nations are about a fourth or a fifth of what they could be in those nations. I'll just sort of have a sense. Now, I'm not putting this up here to say that we should just dump fertilizer all over the world. But the data that I have available don't include uh, different agronomic practices for increasing soil fertility. All the data I can find are on adding fertilizer to increase fertility. So this is a measure of, of just of, of efforts to make soil more fertile here by just dumping on nitrogen. And here are sub-Saharan African nations. All of them are there in these little dots. Here they are South and Southeast Asia. There we are in China. Um, China is almost all manual agriculture equipment. doesn't matter here. But you can see there's a big effect of, the, of this measure of the intensity of agricultural production on what the yields are. There's an awful lot of room to increase yields. So, so now, if you increase them, yes? You, you kind of already said that if you put so much nitrogen, what happens to water and energy? I'm going to get to that in a minute. You are anticipating. But I was afraid you'd feel that way right when I hit this slide. But I couldn't put the other slide first. It would be out of logical order. <laughs> so. Um, so how can you have higher yields? Well, it's well known that you can do things like grow more legumes to increase soil phosphorus, soil nitrogen, but they actually also increase phosphorus. They're very good at mining phosphorus. Um, you can apply fertilizers actually in a fairly precise way, which decreases uh, the relative amount that is lost, improve seeds, irrigation, education. All those things can lead to big increases in yield. That's really what happened in the Green Revolution, maybe minus the use of legumes or precision. Um, <laughs> It's the truth. Um, but if you ask what could you do of, the, of my initial 800 million hectare estimate of how much land would be cleared along uh, business as usual trajectories, you get rid of 600 of that 800 million hectares. You only have to clear 200 million hectares if you close this yield gap. And I'm closing the yield gap in a way um, which doesn't just dump on fertilizer willy-nilly. Um, it actually takes advantage of what's something that's called precision agriculture. And so what precision agriculture is designed to do, it can happen in a very technologically advanced way, it can happen in a very simple way with a little bit of knowledge for a farmer, is to apply the lowest effective amount of inputs, nitrogen, phosphorus, water, pesticides, oh, there we go, um, uh, at the right time throughout the growing season to crop, it can use crops that are, that are better at converting inputs into food. And uh, there are two ways that this has been achieved around the world. One in the, U, in the EU, there's a directive called the Nitrate Directive, 
that was passed in 1995 or so in the European Union. Uh, and here's what happened to the nation, to the European Union. This is their um, nitrogen use intensity, tons of N per hectare per year. And this is yield of crops measured in terms of uh, protein content of all the crops for that nation. Here's Germany. <laughs> Here's Germany. And you can see what it's doing. True time, these the blue dots are 1960 or so, reds are the present time. So blue going to purple to red. It marks up this line, adding more and more N to have higher, higher yields. The nitrate directive was passed. Farmers had to test their fields, apply to, uh, to buy a certain amount of fertilizer. And when they had to actually think about how much fertilizer they were using, what happened, their yields kept going up, but the amount of fertilizer went down. Yields went up about 25 or so percent, and fertilizer went down 20 or 25 percent. That happened in Germany, France, Italy, Mexico. No, no rules, no regulation. Mexico, good. Mexico stopped handing away really cheap fertilizer and cheap seed. Farmers at that time, they thought, were developed enough that they could make it on their own. And when they made it on their own, all on their own, they added less fertilizer but still had higher yields. So what I want to suggest is that there are some ways that we can actually address the major environmental challenge that we face trying to feed a world of nine heading toward 11 billion people. Clearly, healthier diets can have a big impact. Healthier diets are good for us. They're something we uh, 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 are better off because we have them. We have to have a way that people want to do them. We're never going to legislate what we eat, in, at least except in the very major broad stroke ways. Um, we can have the strategic intensification where we increase yields by adding the right amounts, the precise amounts of nutrients that we need on, uh, on land. And in that strategic uh, intensification with that precise agriculture, we're going to need to clear less land. We'll be using less nutrients. The greenhouse gas impacts from all three of these are lower. Now, you can ask, what about adding more nitrogen? You would add more nitrogen globally in the future than we have right now. With our calculations, um, you can let the current high-use nations stay there, or you can have them reduce. Reducing actually makes a bit more sense. But either way, the reduced greenhouse gas emissions from not having to clear all that land more than make up for all of the emissions from the nitrogen that's being added and it becoming nitrous oxide and the greenhouse gas side. On the nutrient pollution side, it, you have to have a more precise use as is happening in Europe. The European uh, Nitrate Directive did lower nitrate loading the groundwaters. The groundwaters, the rivers draining into the oceans around Europe are actually much better, have much lower nitrate levels now than they had before the directive went into place. It worked without any obvious harm to agricultural yields. The yields are on the same time trend they've always been on, but they're on a different trend now for nitrogen use. So I think we can do this. I think if we do this properly, we can do it in a way which actually benefits all people. The people of the poorest nations on the world are the ones who are most in need of food. They're the bottom billion, and from the book that Paul Collier, the economist at, at Oxford, wrote about this, that's really where the majority of the nutritionally challenged, malnourished, malnourished people of the world live. Instead, this is, just sounds so trite. Instead of saying the food aid, why don't we teach them how to farm? You're just dumb. Why do people say this over and over and nothing ever happens? Um, and I think all of these steps, high yield on existing lands, um, we're never going to get rid of people meeting the needs for themselves and their family. But if people, if they can do that in a way which doesn't require more land clearing, doesn't require uh, massive pollution of waters, doesn't require more greenhouse gas release, and there are ways to do this, I think those ways can win. I don't think it, it, you can ever really save nature by buying a fence, buying a piece of land, putting a fence around it. All you do is make somebody clear a different piece of land. If they have a real need for that land, for the food it can produce, for the timber it can produce, they're going to find it someplace else. I think all those kinds of conservation ideas are outdated, outmoded, and not very effective. I think conservation ultimately is going to come down to helping all the peoples of the world meet their needs in ways that are more sustainable for them and for the earth. Thank you. Yes. Follow up on the sure. water question. So water, there are two interactions. One, as you said, it reduces water quality. Mm -hmm. We think there is mm -hmm. runoff. But to grow the food, we also need water. Mm -hmm. There is also a quantity issue. And looking at California Central Valley, mm -hmm. you know, parts of China and India, they are running out of all these underground aquifer water. So if you want to grow so much more food, do we really have enough clean water to grow those foods? Well, um, I didn't say I wanted to grow so much more food. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's come back. What I said was if we 
have diets changed the way they've been changing, that we'll have a demand for about twice as much food as we have right now, twice as much crop production. So I think that change in diets will have to be one part of the solution. Part of it can just be going from the least efficient forms of animal protein production to the most. When you feed protein to a cow uh, to get beef, 1 20th of the protein you put in ends up being protein on a plate that someone can eat. When you feed protein to a cow to get milk, uh, one third of it ends up coming out as milk and the other two thirds are lost. So there's a huge difference in the efficiency depending on the product even just from cattle. Uh, so I would say that we can have much greater efficiency for those who want to be a meat eater. And I, I don't eat much meat, but I don't, I'm not morally opposed to eating it. I just don't like it. Um, so I think that's one, one big thing we can do. I think that what we have are three or four very solid ways that any, any progress on each of those can add up and have fairly large project, uh, progress for the world. I think the biggest lever we have, the one we should be doing, is that of increasing yields in, in low yielding nations. You did mention the potential for genetically modified crops. Well, there's not yet any evidence that they lead to higher yields. If they did, I'd be very proud of them and happy with them. I have nothing against them. I think in the long term, we're going to need genetically modified crops uh, to feed the world. Uh, but um, right now, w when I last analyzed these data, which is three or four years ago, the USDA data on yields, there was about a half a percent to a 1% lower yield from genetically modified corn than there is from normal corn. It has many other advantages as far as ease of, ease of farming for farmers and so on. Uh, and it actually gets rid of some pretty nasty pesticides and replaces them with a relatively less nasty one, Roundup. Uh, so there are some environmental benefits there too. Uh, but um, there's not a yield benefit yet. Nobody has uh, used genetic me methods to have higher yields. Yeah. So thanks for a really interesting talk. I, I thought you were going to end up in a different place. Oh. Because after... You know, you talked about your grassland experiments and this um, tremendous increase in productivity with higher diversity. Mm. Why don't you end up kind of advocating polyculture is the way to, to increase yield? Because you only gave me 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, polyculture can give about oh, 10 to 30 percent more yield in agriculture. It's not as big as the in the ecological systems. Uh, but that's a lot more food. That's 10 to 30% less land you need to clear as a rough approximation. So um, polycultures have been done in many traditional societies. Um, I have a, a colleague at China Agriculture University who's done a lot of work on polycultures, trying to understand the mechanisms whereby they actually give higher yields to try to develop better systems. He was one of the ones who discovered that legumes are not only good at fixing nitrogen, they also are very good at mining phosphorus. Uh, and therefore, the, in a, in a, on low phosphorus soils, they can free up phosphorus that nothing else can do and gives a big yield increase there. So the right combination of species can have a big increase in yield. And I'm really amazed that more U.S. farmers aren't trying to take this on. I, I, was, uh, I, I did a little radio blip uh, on good news at the last holiday for Canadian, whatever, CBC, Canadian Broadcast Company. And they wanted me to tell them I thought it was really exciting it wasn't being done. I said, well, polyculture. I mean, polyculture is, you know, 10 to 20 percent more yield on our farmlands. Farmers should be able to make more money on it, but nobody's doing it. I got a letter from some guy in Saskatchewan who said, I farmed my 5,000 acres with polyculture. And anyway, so a few people do it. <laughs> now, I, I would have done that next. But I don't think it's, it's, it's not as important on a global scale in addressing problems as I think the other ones I mentioned. But I think it's very important. Yeah. So I have a question about that yield gap. That, um, is there any research showing you know, how much of that yield gap is um, you know, given by the nature versus lack of investment? Um, the best work on that are studies that have been done by agronomists who have actually gone to those countries uh, and uh, grown, grown various crops on, on those soils with that climate and seen what their yields are. And so the yield gap is best measured by comparing what real farmers get versus what actually can be achieved on those soils with, with more uh, uh, high intensive practices. And uh, so the, um, there are some countries which just cannot have high yields. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, <laughs> will never have high yields. And if it does, it's at a massive cost for the water they'd have to have available to do it. Uh, but in general, the, the countries I'm calling yield gap are countries where there's, there's firm evidence that they actually can have higher yields. All they need is to have uh, the capital and the knowledge to do it. Yeah. So it looks like you're doing a lot of modeling and predictions. And I'm wondering if you're also um, taking account or, or um, trying to 
tracking what's going to happen in terms of changing climates, right? Because aren't, aren't some climates going to become lakes, big tracts of land, yeah. much less arable? And That's a wonderful question. The question is, what about climate change I haven't taken into account? Well, maybe you have. I <sighs> no, I haven't. Are you kidding? Um, <laughs> it's, um, I have analyzed existing data to look at how climate variation has, has affected yields around the world, because I have all the climate data. I just keep building this bigger and bigger, bigger data set of yields and, and political stability and polity and everything else, and climate and so on. Um, I don't think I'm the right one. I think it'd take me three or four years to really get the expertise to say something I would trust. I mean, I started doing this stuff on food almost 20 years ago, and so I'm now almost trusting myself. I have no training, right? I'm, I'm totally somebody who does. I'm an amateur. I do it out of love. Uh, so um, you all know the origins, I hope, of Latin words. Anyway, never mind. Uh, so I just I can't do it. And there are other people doing it. Uh, and in the short term, the effect of climate change uh, can be somewhat positive. Some areas get longer growing seasons. And because of that, with the right varieties, you can grow more food. In the longer term, there are areas projected to have some very significant declines in food production. So if you go out 50 to 100 years, the projections can be pretty dire for parts of the world. Um, I haven't tried to integrate what these people have projected into my analyses. But it does seem that if, if you were to try to do that, the whole future scenarios would be much more bleak. They might be. Um, the dilemma then, to some extent, there will be climate zones like we have now that produce good crop yields. But it might be that instead of being in Iowa and Minnesota and Illinois, they're in Ontario and Saskatchewan. And the other problem is that soils are a long-term product of the organisms that lived and on those substrates with that climate over thousands of years. That's what, what builds the soil. And if climate changes so quickly, the soils can't keep up. You could well have soils that are not at all suitable. That if you just wait a couple of thousand years, they'd be great soils. Uh, <laughs> but you don't want to wait. And so uh, but that's an issue I have not seen treated by anybody on this. But I think, it's, it, to me, it might be one of the bigger ones with, with massive geologic, uh, uh, geographic shifts in where fertile lands are. Yeah? I always think of the public health enigma. Hmm. As you get people to eat healthier food, you extend their length of life. And therefore, you're trapping this as you're trying to catch up with the population. You're getting farther behind and you're producing it. I was just curious. Well, that's a really good. I haven't looked at it. I actually thought about that. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd be delighted to people had longer lives, right? Uh, I think it's compared to the, to the other effects, it's, it's a, a secondary uh, order. It may not be. I'm not sure. And the other interesting thing, though, is that so when I talk about this to undergraduates, the, and I, uh, the, their first thought is that it must be that the main factor keeping population down in exploding nations uh, around the world is food availability. Mm -hmm. So they all say, well, you can't increase their ability to produce food. It'll just turn it into more people. And I show them the data. And you know, the, the lowest per capita food supply in the world has the highest growth rates and, and vice versa. So it actually goes exactly opposite what they would expect. In fact, people. Uh, re, re, uh, reduce their rate of increase uh, when there are different kinds of societal pressures, such as needing education and so on. We all know these things, and opportunity for women. It has nothing to do with food. Food is not a major limiting factor for almost anybody if you look at the broad sweep of, of life on Earth. Yes? I'm really interested in the trends between uh, nitrogen use and uh, yields, and, yeah, but your data was chronological. I was wondering for low yield regions, do, uh, do I have to go through that phase of using more nitrogen and then, then breaking through with technology and other things? Um, you know, the, the low yielding nations basically have soils that are infertile right now, that are not high, highly enough fertile to have the yields which could be obtained on them. So they have to have some way to have higher rates of supply of nitrogen, phosphorus, in some cases water. Yeah, I don't think there's any, I don't think any way around that. The issue might be more of what provides it. Do you get that by having programs which teach them how to build uh, organic matter and so on uh, by agronomic practices, or do you just get it by putting on fertilizer? The fast, easy way is to put on fertilizer. Everyone understands that. It's easy, it's fast, it's instant, instant gratification. Uh, it may not be the wisest long-term way. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. My pleasure.